Well, good morning, Pastor Vlad. I am so excited to have you this morning on our podcast. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, jump on here with me and tell me a little bit about what you guys are doing. Uh, but before we dive into uh, all of that, uh, Pastor, why don't you tell me tell me a little bit about yourself? How did you, uh, w- w- where are you at in the world, first of all? And then how did you get involved in ministry? Well, thanks for having me uh, with you uh, this morning. And uh, uh, just to jump quickly to answer your question, uh, I just jumped in ministry when I was like about 26. Uh, myself, I left Romania uh, for UK uh, when I was 20. I left Romania, so I went to UK to uh, be for a, for a while there. And I lived in UK for 17 years. So there I started my ministry. I've been in ministry for 11 years in UK as a youth pastor. So after a while, um, uh, just God had his plans and he got us back in Romania. So now I'm a, a, a pastor as well in a Baptist church here. It's not very, not very far away from Suchaba, north of Romania. Okay, north of Romania. Okay. And and how long have you been the pastor of your church there or, or been active in your church there? Uh, for two years. Two years. Okay. And is it a, a big church, small church, a home church? What kind of church is it? It's a, a, a very small uh, church. Um, it's almost like planting again the church. The church was a little bit bigger before, but, uh, you know, the youth left for bigger towns or they left for abroad to, to go and work a little bit. So uh, now the church is decreased. So we're trying to uh, ramp up again with the work there for God's kingdom. So trying to help to grow the church again. You, you know, it's interesting. I've talked to a number of pastors, and I know for those listening to the pod, who have been listening to the podcast, we see a trend of that, of, of youth pastors who kind of go into full-time pastor, you know, become full-time pastors over time. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about uh, our partner church down in, in uh, Bralia in, in southern Romania, uh, kind of the same thing. Pastor Joshua started as their youth pastor. And now he's their senior pastor. And uh, it seems to be a trend. Uh, so if you're listening right now and you're a youth pastor, watch out. Because uh, there might be a pastor a pastor calling for you here. So, uh, well, tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, obviously you guys are, are fairly close to Ukraine. How, how far are you guys from the border of Ukraine? That would be like about 50 kilometers. I don't know, like about 30 miles. That would be okay. Yeah, uh, from, from the border of Ukraine. Yeah. And is that where the there's a crossing? I assume there, or or is there? Do you have yeah. to go somewhere else? Okay. No, no, no. The crossing there. Yeah. Crossing right there. So obviously, uh, leading up to the February twenty fourth, twenty fourth of February, when the war began, you guys are thirty miles from the border. You're hearing, I'm sure like we were here in the United States, you're hearing Russia is building troops on the border, uh, you know, preparing, you know, to potentially go into Ukraine and and start a war there, which, of course, no one thought would even be possible or would happen um, because, you know, we live in 2022, not back in World War II anymore. Um, What were you guys thinking? I mean, were you vigilant of that? Did you think it was going to happen? Uh, from a pastor's perspective and from your congregation's perspective, what was kind of the word on the street? Well, uh, I had, you know, like you, you know, like, you know, all this information, like they're building troops and stuff like this. And uh, we thought uh, maybe they're going to come to like uh, a negotiation uh, between the countries and nothing will happen. And, uh, you know, life will go quiet and it's going to be good. Uh, we had that COVID crisis, so we never thought we we're going to jump into another crisis with the war. Uh, that was our feeling. We prayed and, uh, you know, wait to see what's going on. And uh, mm-hmm. as you, we've been surprised to see, like, over the night, uh, all these uh, bombardments which they start uh, uh, in Ukraine by by Russian troops. 
and uh, everything started like very fast here. <laughs> it's like probably the the now the next hours they start crossing. It was a queue at the border trying to get to Romania. Yeah, you know, I I saw a a video from the crossing there in New York City, uh, and the line was long. It was a very long line of people, and of course, it was winter time. Yeah, the red border were we next to yeah, and and so uh, you know, people were cold. They it just seemed like it was going on forever. So th- those first few days, what did you experience? Uh, how did your church? Uh, and I know when we were talking uh, before this, you were mentioning you work with a ministry as well. Um, those first few days as this really the surge of people came across the border, what role did you guys play? Well, uh, as you said, first um, in this refugee crisis, uh, for me was with the ministry where I'm also involved. It, it's called Fight for Freedom. And um, we started here as a, uh, uh, recap center for ex-offenders and homeless people and uh, we had uh, the capacity to get people in uh, so when we uh, saw all this crisis next to the to the border uh, we just said uh, quickly to improvise and to uh, prepare our place for people who had to come uh, and, uh, and stay overnight and for how long uh, they need um, uh, and then to get uh, a direction wherever they want to go. Because uh, in the beginning, uh, many of them, they knew where they go. There were people which they had relatives somewhere in Europe. Um, so pretty much they were in transit through Romania. Uh, so quickly uh, we prepared ourselves and uh, we managed to organize uh, very quickly and uh, we helped uh, a lot of uh, a lot of refugees. I think in the in that period of time, we probably touched the life of about forty thousand refugees with our organization. Wow! And um, in one way or another, uh, we had tents by the border in Siret, so we load up buses and coaches with people straight from the border and direct them through other churches in the country, which they were wide open with arms to receive them. Uh, but we were closer here, so they um, collaborate with us. Or either we had them straight to our centers. We had two centers, one in the town and one not very far away from Suceava, which was uh, the bigger capacity there to receive people. So we received uh, uh, a lot of refugees there, feed them over the, the night, uh, let them to warm up and then help them with the train tickets, help them to find, the, you know, uh, like a transport in Europe and try, you know, organize for them so they can have internet, they can have like uh, um, access to phones and, you know, all this, so they can get connected with their uh, uh, connections, which they were in another countries. And and from what I've heard, I mean, you know, especially during those first few weeks of, of the war, uh, obviously m- men were being asked to stay back, to stay behind and help uh, fight. Um and so, as I've heard from a lot of the other guests that we've had on on the podcast, did you see a lot of the women and children and elderly come across? Was that kind of the initial surge that you saw come through your facility as well? Um, and then yes. also, go ahead. Yes, that was the case, and uh, we organized very quickly uh, because we saw um, the vulnerability of uh, the human. Person. To happen there. I mean, they were good people. Uh, the church was in the streets. They're trying to receive people, um, you know, in their churches or maybe, you know, just simple believers just going there and trying to get people uh, towards, in, you know, to their family to, to accommodate them in the home and stuff like this. But there were also some bad people in the street. Um, so uh, we tried to organize quick to try to. Uh, inform the people which they, they print all kind of uh, 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 you know uh, labels to try to make aware the women and the children to don't jump like in 
which car they see and they offer a transport somewhere just to go with proper ONGs recognized by the governments and recognized by the local authorities. Uh, that was right in the beginning and after that uh, the authorities, they organized themselves and there was a lot of buses from there coming straight to our center. Um, um, so, yeah, we had then the tent for weeks in the beginning, 24 hours people there trying to do this work wow. and uh, prepare uh, the transport for, for them in safe ways. And how, how many how many people can your facility there hold? Um, you know, if it, when it's when it was full at its fullest capacity, how many people were actually staying with you there at your facility? In the beginning, um, uh, we had a capacity like about a hundred something people, 120, 150 people. Uh, but we have different uh, uh, sides of the building which the uh, was there but not prepared for them so we had to work hard uh, trying to prepare more rooms to accommodate more people so now our facility probably can uh, receive like about almost 200 250 people right now wow so you get so you get 150 people in and i i think that what people forget uh here in the united states is you know not only do you get folks that need a bed to sleep in, but you're also having to feed them three times a day. So, you know, this is becoming really a, a lot of logistics and, and at the same time, trying to help them, uh, you know, get to their next destination, whether that be, you know, Poland, Germany, or, or even further West in, in Europe. Um, so there are a lot of moving parts when this is happening. Um, so, I, yeah, I commend you. As I've told so many of the pastors, I'm I'm so in awe of how quickly um, churches pull together, and how quickly you know. Now you guys, I know had a, the ministry that was already kind of set up for that, but probably not for a surge like <laughs> you know like this, where it's like okay, now we we're, we're filling up the the facility. So, um, what are what are some of the stories that stand out? Are there any stories from those first few weeks that you, of, of, of people that you just like that touch your heart when you think about them and you, you know, even maybe to this day, you're like, I wonder how this person's doing. Uh, yes. I mean, there were, uh, it was a lot of children, uh, and single moms, single mom. They were just, you know, the man who was left, behind the border and so they come you know uh, just past the border by themselves you know with the children there uh, uh, and uh, especially the ones which they came straight from the areas where they were affected by the attacks uh, they were scared and you know you could see and read on their faces uh, they were a little bit so uh uh, disorientated. They didn't know what to go and what to do. They just crossed the border and then, you know, what's going on from here? God knows. But uh, right. it, it was, it was um, uh, uh, for us um, uh, a privilege to help uh, these stories. We had in the beginning like a lot of uh, people also from like different parts of the UK or different students from different countries, which they come out first and then uh, start to come, uh, you know, people from there, from Ukraine also. Uh, it was hard to see uh, uh, these kids uh, just going somewhere and nowhere, just trusting their parents. They're going to get them somewhere where to be safe. Um, and and yeah. we just jumped into it. Um, and uh, we sh the, 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 here in the north of the country is a very large community of e evangelics. It, it's, it's it's okay. It's, it's, uh, it's we know as you know the traditional church, but it's quite big, comparing with different parts of the of the country. So the church was in the street and give a nice tone, 
uh, with the refugee crisis and, and, and help in a very nice way. And the authorities, they knew that and they were pleasant to see us uh, working and collaborating with them. They got in touch with us. We've been in touch with the government, with the local authorities. Everybody knew what we were doing. They were very, very happy with that. Um, and um, they saw so much love. Um, and in some point, uh, they just asked us why you do that for us, because our local authorities, they haven't done what you do for us. And the only thing what we could do at that moment, we just said, because of Christ's love. And because he loved us and he showed love, he asked us to do the same thing is because of him. And I think that was a enough answer for them to know what they received, it was because of him. And um, we had a lot of volunteers coming um, and to help us. We have volunteers from UK, from the States, so many we had here to help us. We had volunteers from France. We had volunteers from Italy. And some of them, non-believers. And mm. um, when they come there, uh, they said if it wasn't for Christ, 80% of what's happening would never happen. Wow. So it was a, a, a good witness uh, to everybody. For the refugees, for the volunteers which they come, it just was an opportunity. Uh, the church, just to witness, uh, maybe, you know, not so much uh, sharing you know, uh, the gospel just in this direction, helping. They saw the practical part of the gospel. Uh, not so much maybe preaching sometimes because people, they were so, um, you know, tired and, and they just wanted, you know, to see someone caring for them. And well, we've been there and they saw that and we explained why That's that it. happened. That's incredible, you know, and I, I've I've heard that in so many of these uh, these podcasts, so many of these interviews of of um, uh, pastors saying that they were surprised at how quickly the churches, uh, many of whom didn't even know each other, pulled together uh, and and just said, you know, we we got to do something, we got to help, right? And and I was, uh, you know, I think back to a couple of the earlier interviews I've had with a couple of the folks who you're the refugees who crossed. And they all said the same thing. You know, some of, some of them were believers and evangelical believers, but some were not. And they just said, we couldn't understand why these people that we didn't know would be so kind to us. You know, we came across, I remember talking to one young lady and she said, you know, she came across the border with, with her couple children and she had no clue where she, where she was going to go. She had no idea. Um, and immediately she was greeted by a, a, a church and she just felt like she could trust them. And, uh, and, and then they ended up taking great care of her and, and, uh, you know, just story after story like that, it just shows what happens when, when the church does what the church and, and I, I'm preaching to the, to the U S church here just as much, you know, when the church does what the church is supposed to do, you know, people are drawn. They are truly the beacon on the hill, the lighthouse on the hill. You know, uh, people will be drawn to that light when when the church is doing what they're supposed to and not necessarily fighting or infighting or trying to, you know, compare each other's congregation size and all of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and I think we've seen that a, a living example of that, um, you know, there in, in Romania and Poland and, and Ukraine. Um I want to segue just for a moment here. So uh, I know that you had a chance recently here within the last couple of weeks uh, to go back into Ukraine uh, and this time just really spend it ministering the gospel, just sharing with people uh, the hope of Jesus Christ. Tell, tell me a little bit about that. Tell me what that was like. Um, uh, you know, first of all, where did you guys uh, generally, where did you guys go? Um, what was the reception? Yeah, just before to share that with you, I just realized uh, I uh, said a lot of things what we've done with our ministry, uh, but not so much what we uh, 
um, accomplished with the church where I'm a pastor. Our church is not as close as Sushchava uh, to the border, but it's quite close as well too. So when I saw all this uh, crisis with the refugees, um, I said to the church, listen, I know we don't have much potential to help because it's, it's not a very big church. But I said, we got a pastoral house here, which is built, it's got pretty much everything we need. We can put whatever, you know, is missing and we can help too with the with the house here and to receive. So um, they've been very happy to do that. So. We give the pastoral house for about, I think, three months, like about, I think it was uh, a young family, their parents, her sister, and like about three or four kids. So we had also in in, in our church, in the pastoral house, um, like about eight people for like about three months, uh, just wow. give them a, a shelter, where to go, uh, where to sleep, uh, and then uh, help them with the food, covered the utility bills and they've just been there for, you know, as much as they needed. Um, also, one of them, uh, uh, he was very active in the border, trying to help Ukrainians uh, uh, to find the ways to travel either in Europe or either somewhere in Romania. So that was uh, uh, part of what we've done with the church uh, that we could, you know, uh, to here, uh, I just said to you, it's not a, a very big church. It's not a massive church. It's, uh, uh, it's like planting, but we were gladly to put wherever we could to help. Um, yeah, not far ago, I just been to Ukraine, uh, and um, I think like about ten or more than ten pastors. We just uh, crossed the border. I've been somewhere. Is, I think it's called Trinita, is next to the border to Romania in one part and also with Moldova. Um, I've just been there uh, in that church. Um, I found refugees there too. Uh, now uh, most of the refugees are in those parts in Ukraine where the war um, is not there. Uh, so they had refugees in their church. Um, I've been there with my family. We just served there. They've been uh, very happy to have us. They've been very happy to hear how the Ukrainians are helped when they cross the borders um, into Romania and how they get directed. They were very happy uh, to hear how much food we sent. Um, again, I have to say with, our, with the ministry, which I'm involved, uh, I probably sent about uh, probably now over... 1,500 tons probably. We gain near 2,000 wow. tons of food we've sent already in Ukraine and we're still sending a lot of food. Even today we had like about eight fans, which they're going somewhere further, Kev, into an area where it's quite risky. I'm not going to say the name of the town. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, with about 10 tons of food uh, just going there. Uh, tomorrow, wow. God willing, it was about 2,000 people, uh, which they're going to come and hear the gospel and then going to receive some help, uh, some goods for their need. Um, uh, that, so, that, that's amazing. And it, it, it echoes what I've heard a couple of other folks tell me who are doing some of the relief work in Ukraine is they said that although the borders have slowed down meaning not as many people are crossing the borders except for maybe down in near the odessa region uh, i know that kind of picks up and slows down picks up and slows down depending on 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 the attacks but um they said what they've seen is they've seen a large amount of ukrainians pile you know refugees kind of piling into these border cities on the ukraine side still because they're not certain what could happen so they want to be close enough to be able to, to to evacuate if needed but they don't necessarily want to leave their country just yet so um is that kind of what you were saying you were experiencing is some of these cities border cities in ukraine are still have a lot of refugees there yes 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 they do have and it's a lot of churches which they do have uh, refugees in, in in their facilities there and they help them and they take care of them. Uh, and they, they wait to see what's going on. They wait to see what's going on. Yeah. 
you, you know, let me let me ask you this question. Uh, how, how, how do you see this going? I mean, obviously, we're watching this very closely here. Um, uh, who knows the mind of Putin, right? I mean, if we knew that, we this would probably all be over. Um, uh, what, from from a from a, a neighboring country, from Romania, you're looking over, you know, literally thirty miles to to your east, seeing what's happening. Um, what what are your thoughts? How how what do you think is going to happen? Well, it's it's. Very hard to say what's, what will happen, but uh, the only thing which we know, uh, Russia spent a lot of money. And I don't think they're going to pull back until they're not going to receive what they want. Uh, either a good negotiation, which, uh, you know, they're going to make them happy or who knows where they go in their mind. Uh, well, it's it's very hard to predict what's what will happening, uh, what will happen in the future. Uh, um, it, it for for Ukrainians, it, it's hard. It's us for we Romanians too, because we placed in between powers, between the West and Russia, which is a power. Um, so it's hard. We are in the NATO now, so now we're part of NATO, but they are not. So basically, the only, you know, ground between NATO and Russia is Ukraine, and is there Belarus. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's hard for them geographically. It's very hard for them. Uh, they have to work around something, I think, to be good neighbors with Russia because then they're sharing a border, a quite big border with Russia. And probably they have to work around something to be also, you know, good friends and, and business with, with, with the West. Um, it, it's, it's difficult, the situation. I mean, it's just between two big powers and it, it's, it's hard for them. They will have to, you know, uh, think very careful what they're doing. Yeah, you know, I I, I agree. I think it's definitely a, um, uh, you know, it's it's a situation we didn't think we'd ever see again in our world. You know, and and uh, I was talking to, or I was reading an article just the other day about you know even Moldova's concern. You know, their their leadership is concerned that if you know, of course, they're closer down there to the Odessa region. So if Russia moves in there, would they potentially look at you know coming into Moldova? And of course, you know, we have our, our clinics there as well. So it, it's definitely a sticky situation. And um, like you just said, you know, all we can do is really pray and, and know that God is in control and that, you know, he has this, uh, he has his grand plan that is bigger than, than all of us. But at the same time, you know, and I, I'm sure you could attest to this a little bit, um, it's amazing to see the gospel spread through something so tragic as war. The gospel message is being spread in some ways. I use this term gently, but forcefully out uh, because people are being displaced. You know, we saw that happen in the New Testament. You know, uh, people became kind of stagnant and kind of stayed in one area. And then there was a displacement and 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 it force that gospel message to continue to go out and for, for people to see that God is, is in control. So, um, it, yeah, but, but uh, I mean, we, we, we hear the story like, you know, churches, which they're, you know, empty before even the believers didn't love too much to go to the church. Now they got two or three or four programs in a day, services in a day, and they are full and they baptizing a lot of people. And uh, people that are coming to Christ, even in crises like this, you know, God works His purposes and His plans always goes forward, uh, even we Ab don't understand it. Absolutely, absolutely, they do. Well, as we kind of wrap up the uh, the podcast for this morning, I want to ask you this question. You know, uh, we have so many people here, and as I as we talked about before the podcast, and and as you know, my listeners have heard me say before. You know, 
Uh, just because this situation has fallen off the front page of the newspaper or the front page of the website, there's still a lot going on over there. There's still a war raging. There are still men and women losing their lives. There are still civilians who are under attack. There are still people who are displaced. Um, do you, by the way, do you happen to have anyone still at your facility or is your facility yes. empty at the moment? No. Our facility is full. Uh, we work so hard. We prepare it. And God prepared the way in an orphanage near Odessa. Just moved into our facility. So at the moment, we have 75 kids. Zero, four years. 50 staff. Oh, wow. And 20, 30 kids of the staff. And they said, since we are in Romania, we can sleep. Because... When we were in, in, in our place, um, we heard the sirens in the night. So we had to take the kids from the beds and just go in the, in, in the bunker, just go in the basement. And that will happen maybe two or two or three times in the night. So they say, since we are here, we can finally sleep and we have quiet and peaceful here. So our facility is, is, is full and God be praised because wherever we work, hard is used and is well used and I'm, I'm, I'm so happy you know because I want that, to yeah that that praise God for you and 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 for your your ministry and your church and their heart for being willing to to, to, to do that and and you, you know he, I, I'm sitting here in Dallas Texas right and I can't imagine what it would be like waking up in the middle of the night hearing these sirens going off i mean occasionally we'll get a tornado here and the sirens will go off for the tornado but you know they're usually off within a couple of seconds you know but i can't imagine that the idea of hearing these sirens drone on and on and on and the uncertainty that you may not make it you know and and then and, and then you put that that same mindset into a a three four or five year old you know, you just think about all of the healing that's going to need to take place emotionally and mentally and, and spiritually with these young children and, uh, yes. and some of the, some of the images that they've potentially seen, um, you know, as they were leaving um, stuff that no, that the very few children will ever have to experience. So uh, I am so glad that they have, have a, have a place to be able to go and, and feel that safety and feel that love of Christ, and of course, obviously, have their their needs taken care of. Um, these are so these are orphans. So these are kids that don't have a mom and dad anymore. Uh, are some of these are these some of these kids whose moms or dads died in the war, or they were orphans before? Just uh, it was just an orphanage. No, I don't reckon they're orphans from the war. I think there was, you know, abandoned kids, or you know. Uh, Whatever happened, they, they they left them there for some reasons or something like this. Yeah, it's just yeah. like the whole institution moved from the Ukraine. Wow, that's that's and it's amazing that God had a facility, your facility in mind, uh, when those when this broke out, and He knew that those kids were going to be in your facility and uh, receiving the gospel message and and their daily uh, you know needs being met. So, well. So that 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 right there that gets the question out. What can we do? What how can we continue here in the United States? Um, how how can we help you and your ministry and your church um, with your 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 current needs? Because I'm sure that when you set off in your budgets in January first, you did not have a war column in your budget that said, hey, we're going to budget all this money for the war. You know, you had obviously plans, things you were going to do this year. And I'm sure a lot of that kind of got reallocated. How, how can we help? Uh, you know, we, we, we just said here, we're going to help first long God that will provide. Um, so if God wants to do something, he will provide. So uh we're going to send goods and food to Ukraine for as long as it's going to provide. Uh, we're going to feed people and, you know, we have these orphans here, so we could just going to, we have them. And then God, you know, he knows and he provides, you know, it's like about almost 
150, 200 people, they get fed up here at the, our uh, center, at the ministry here, wherever we are. So uh, pray for us. So God will give us strength because at some point it is so many challenges and you have to have so much patience and uh, to have uh, the mental resources to face the challenges and to push forward, to give us, you know, health and just to get to his, uh, his ministry prepared for us in these particular times. And also, I just have to be very honest with you. Uh, we had a lot of work, uh, help from people from the States, from organization. I mean, we couldn't do if other people like you, which are far away, they wouldn't feel with the need and, and they partner with us. And, uh, we did that kind of work. So you can, you know, firstly, you have to pray for us. <laughs> right. Pray for us. That is the first need to pray for us. We, we, we need and, and to cut to keep peace. Because, uh, you know, uh, the word to stay where it is, to don't ramp up, to don't go bigger, to don't go off the scale, to don't come, you know, it, it, it just, things can, uh, you know, um, can be very slippery. Uh, so we should pray like God to don't allow to go more than that. It will be damage for everybody. Um, and then if he can help in some ways financially, in some point when he can and wherever he can listen, you know, wherever he's going to come, we will go and we'll do the work as long God will provide. And I, we know God provides through his people too. Absolutely. And so let me ask you this, Pastor. I mean, if there were people who are listening to the podcast right now who wanted to come over and help you, um, are, do you is that something you need or, or are you guys okay there? Well, the biggest challenge of the ministry where we are now um, is a warehouse to build. That's our biggest challenge right now. We go all over food coming around. We go all over organization, just jumping and just... Uh, um, partnershiping with us and they, they bring a lot of goods. Uh, the only thing which is very hard uh, is where to store. So we're trying to find a solution with a warehouse because we're trying at the moment to uh, get the food put in packs or either in bags and we just go ourselves and we give to people. For example, if we go in the Chernowitz area where it's very close to our border, we're only going to give the food and the uh, goods to people which they're going to give us an ID with the uh, areas where uh, it's been affected by the war. So we're not going to give help, for example, to uh, someone which lives in Chernowitz because there was a war. I know maybe it can be difficult, but still they're going a little bit. But there's a lot of refugees there. So we only give to the people uh, which uh, they really need. So they left the house and they live somewhere. So we need to take care of them. Uh, and uh, sometimes um, it takes a while until you pack all the food and you organize the logistic and you organize everything to get. So you need a uh, uh, unique place where to organize yourself. You need like a warehouse. So that is the biggest challenge where we, we have. So you just pray for us um, so we can meet uh, this need, so we can be more fruitful uh, to, to do this ministry with the relief there. Absolutely. Well, uh, if you're watching the podcast right now, as I, as I like to do so often as we, we bring things to a close here, uh, I, I want to encourage you, you know, as, as Pastor Vlad just said, please be praying. Please be praying. Uh, the number one thing that I think every pastor I've talked to, that's number one is prayer, 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 prayer. And you once again heard it from Pastor. Obviously, prayer for the refugees, prayer for those who have been displaced, prayer to, for protection of soldiers, but prayer for the refugee, uh, for the relief workers, uh, because so many of these folks are working around the clock, um, you know, and they're away from their families. Um, they're, some of them are putting themselves in harm's way to try to make sure they can get supplies to people who need it the most. And so, Keep them in your prayers as well, that God will give them, you know, strength and supernatural rest when they have that ability to get some rest and that there'll be a hedge of protection on their lives as they're going uh, and, and trying their best to be obedient to what God is calling them to do. 
And then also, you know, you heard uh, Pastor just say, you know, a, a warehouse facility. Um, it, it's amazing because we've heard that before as well. Uh, people needing just a place, uh, you know, even large ministries. I, I think about some of the the larger ministries, nonprofits that are working in the area. And that was one of the, the struggles that they had first moving into the country uh, was trying to find a place where they could set up shop. You know, they, they had the, the material, they had, they had the food, they just needed a place to be able to organize it. And so uh, if you, maybe you're listening to this and you're over in uh, you, you know, Romania and you know someone up in this area that has some space available, uh, reach out and and know that there are people who are looking for it uh something so simple as a warehouse uh could could me mean a lot especially moving into winter because now we're going to be thinking about a lot of the winter necessities which is a more you know different type of clothing obviously there's there's shortage of gas and natural gas and propane so it's going to look a little different this year so having that stuff available in a place to store that stuff so they can get it over to the the folks who need it most um, Pastor, let me ask you this kind of in closing, if people want to follow your journey, uh, what is the best way for them to follow you? Are you on social media at all? Yeah, they can find us on Facebook or, uh, just, just type fight for freedom, so Chava, or fight for freedom. They're going to find us there and they're going to, okay. uh, see what we're doing and we're posting quite regularly there. Uh, um, so they're going to awesome. see well, what we're doing. I'll make sure that we include that link up when we post the uh, everything up on onto our different uh, social media channels, uh, so people can just click right over and follow you guys. And uh, want to encourage you if you're listening, do that. Follow the stories. Follow the stories. Just because the media is not reporting on them, doesn't mean they're not happening. And uh, and so, uh, Pastor, I just want to say thank you so much for sh taking you know the, the the forty minutes with me today and 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 sharing. Um, your experiences. And I am so grateful. As I said earlier, I'm so grateful for people like yourself and, and your congregation and, and, and those you work with in your ministry who have opened their hearts and who have said, yeah, you know what? It doesn't, we don't see Ukrainian. We don't see Polish. We don't see Moldovan. We don't see Romanian. We see people who are in need of a savior and people who are in need of help. And, and that really becomes the, the, the war cry, if you will, of, of the, the evangelical church right now. We go and we help. We are the hands, we are the feet of Christ. So thank you so much for everything you're doing. And uh, I look forward, hopefully, to talking to you again sometime in the future and uh, hearing, you know, once all this the dust settles here and hearing how things play out. Sound good? Yeah, that sounds very good. Yeah, and hopefully we're going to come with more news, uh, uh, which is going to show uh, the great God of work of the God's kingdom and uh, how he's progressing here in Romania. Amen to that. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor. I'll let you have a wonderful night tonight, and uh, please try to get some rest and and again, next time you see your congregation and your the, your fellow workers in ministry, thank them on behalf of us and uh, for all their hard work. All right. Yes. Thank you, Pastor. Sean here. Thank you so much for listening to today's podcast. If you enjoyed it, please consider giving it a like, a follow, and a share. And if you're listening to this on your favorite podcast platform, consider giving it five stars. I look forward to sharing the next story with you real soon. <laughs>